You're listening to the Women Talking About Learning podcast. My name is Andrew Jacobs. Welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode, the compilation one of the Women Talking About Learning podcast. We've done 17 full episodes of the podcast now, with more scheduled. And for International Women's Day, rather than do an International Women's Day special, I thought, actually, what I prefer to do is just have a listen back to the ones that I've listened to the most and pick out some of the clips that I think you might want to hear again. So this episode is lots of short clips of some of my favourite moments. If they're not your favourite moments, please tell me. I'd love to find out the bits that have really meant something to you. And I will put a little bit of commentary around some of them, just to explain why they have that meaning for me. If you've listened to the podcast before and you don't want to hear these again, that's fine, that's cool. If you want to skip through my bits and just listen to those again, that's cool. (laughs) I've got no problem with that. This is Women Talking About Learning, This is lots of women talking about lots of different topics. My experience with the imposter syndrome began as a child. I grew up in a traditionally middle-class family. My parents were educated. And yet my voice was often not heard, nor was my opinion or thoughts asked for or valued, which created challenges for me growing up. My self-esteem was poor and I found that I shouldn't share my voice. I believed that I shouldn't share my voice and this transferred into my professional career. Despite having a master's degree, a doctorate degree in psychology, I have found myself For many years, not sharing my ideas, doubting myself, doubting the knowledge base that I have. I was worried and concerned about making mistakes personally and professionally. And to this day, even though my voice is being heard and I don't hold back in meetings, I do doubt sometimes when I share something. My self-doubt comes from our gender roles, being dismissed by males, thinking that the school I attended to get my graduate degree or my doctoral degree, because it was an Ivy League, I didn't meet the standards, I couldn't compete and couldn't work with those who attended more prestigious schools. From these experiences, my personality is I am an overachiever. I seek professional uh, perfectionism. And that creates more anxiety for me. Just thinking about creating this, this recording. Will it be good enough? Will I have shared my voice enough? In my 50 years of life, I've come to realize that at times people will want to hear what I have to say and other times I will be dismissed. And I won't own that dismissiveness. That is a choice that that other person is making. When I first heard that clip from Dr. Sarah Thompson, it stopped me in my tracks. It was one small clip that was submitted for the imposter syndrome episode. And when I heard it, I immediately realised that it had to be the first clip on the whole episode because it described circumstances and situations that I just had no concept of. Our next clip is Christina Gadd in conversation with Dawn Sillett in the consultant one. And this clip is the first moment when I realised how far this podcast had to work. 
I can think back to lots of things. I, I often compare it to my uh, previous career and I think back to engineering and I think a low point for me in engineering was going to a client's um, premises and being greeted with two colleagues. I had two colleagues with me and being greeted by the client um, and he kissed my hand. He actually kissed my hand and said, oh, how lovely, how delightful, a lady engineer. And I just, I went puce, absolutely puce. And my colleagues thought this was hilarious. But it was, um, it was quite wearing, you know, because I think most of my working life, I've not been hugely ambitious. I've just wanted to do a really good job. I love mm. helping people and I love to do a good job. Um, my parents... Um, you know, always had a good work ethic. And so I grew up with that. So that's what I've wanted to do. And, and actually, a lot of the time, some of the stuff that happened in engineering just got in the way of me doing a good job, you know, and I didn't moan about it very much. But it was, yeah, that was a low point, somebody kissing my hand. And he actually, he was being, he, he thought he was being charming um, <laughs> at the time. And then at lunch at lunchtime, <laughs> there was an even better thing. I, I was uh, sitting there and uh, listening to the conversation two of my colleagues were having because it, it didn't really involve me. And the client turned around and he said, oh, let's not talk about all this boring stuff let's talk about holidays and ladies dresses shall we and again Ooh. it was just sort of like oh my goodness so it was just no. so moving into IT training I I didn't sort of encounter that quite as much so um... I've told Christina that I call it that moment because that was the moment when I recognized that there were stories that I had no idea of. Let's have a listen to a couple more. Okay, I was just wondering, um, have you, do you see anything different being a woman in film industry? I mean, for me particularly, I haven't, other than I, I tend to speak to more women that are camera shy, but in the industry that's where you've been behind the camera, is there anything that you've experienced that you want to share? So whilst we were working in the film industry, you found a lot of women were obviously drawn to like the makeup, the costume design, the set designs, things like that. When it came to the technical elements, say behind the camera, the director of photography, the sound, they were on the majority men. So there was one person that I knew that was a camera woman. Um, a lot of the time, she she didn't struggle, but it, it was more difficult for her um, because they tend to assume, and I found this working in organizations, if I'm going in with, and I've been lucky enough to have a great kit. So I've had a professional camera, lights, green screen, a full rig um, that I've had to traipse up three flights of stairs and things like that. So... <laughs> I find that if I'm doing that, lots of people offer me help. Oh, are you okay with that? I'll help. And, and I'm like, no, no, I'm fine. Whereas my colleagues who are male, they don't get that. And then I turn up with all this equipment and they're like, are you sure you're okay setting this up? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. So I think there's a lot of, it sounds horrible to say, but you're a woman. Are you, are you sure you know what you're doing? Um, and it's yeah. like, yes, I, I'm, perfectly capable of, of setting the lights up um but I think it's it's I don't know whether it's the I feel like I should help you because it's obviously a lot of kit and it it can be quite heavy mm. uh, depending on obviously how big the lights are or the camera kit is so I think there's that I, I want to help you whereas my male colleagues have never been offered and <laughs> it drives them insane interesting um, so and there's that technical side of if I get into conversations about editing software, sometimes you can see them going, oh, you, you, do, you do know what you're talking about. Um, I think it is still a male dominated area. Um, bringing it to learning, it becomes very different. Mm. Because at that point, it's very much an open, the genders are split equally. Mm -hmm. um, but if we're just talking video, I think at that moment, it's, males uh it's changing it is definitely improving and there's a lot more women out there um and a lot more women that are getting their voices heard 
there was a professor recently, he tweeted about how he, um, he was invited to present at a conference and he asked who was on the panel and it was all men. And he said, no, thank you very much. I'm not going to present because there's no women on the panel. Mm -hmm. And everyone applauded it, everyone liked it. Mm -hmm. And I replied and I said, that's lovely, but women aren't gonna get into the room until you leverage yourself for a woman. So whilst it's great that you say, no, there are no women on the panel, they're gonna find a guy that's gonna say yes and still not put a woman on the panel. What you will say is yes, but I'm gonna suggest these women and I suggest that you also take a woman onto the panel, otherwise I will not do it. And start to open up, because these people don't know we exist. He didn't even reply to my tweet. And I sat there and thought, is it signaling or was it true feminism? Because if it was true feminism, he should have said, that's a very interesting viewpoint. Mm -hmm. I had not considered that. And, and that's an interesting point because this is something that I, I've been struggling with is, is you know, the, the speaker circuit and, and whatnot. Because there are times where I know I'm being invited because I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. And I know that I'm being invited because I have a social media presence. And I know that, you know, LinkedIn, you know, I can do a post on LinkedIn and it can get 40,000 views. And am I being commoditized. Um, and that's, and so there are things that I've actually turned down, even though I would have been the woman on the panel, but because what I'm really being used for is signaling that we're a great company who embraces women. If you want to embrace women, hire them. Um, don't ask them to do a webinar for free, or don't yeah. ask them to do a post on your behalf. That's, you know, going to signal that you're a diverse and embracing employer when you aren't. Um, and, and that's something that I really, really have struggled with. And there, there have actually been, as I said, you know, ones that I, I've, I've turned down or I've also turned down because I know some of the men on the panel, <laughs> speaking of tweets, mm -hmm. have said some very unsavory things about women. And I thought, why am I going to put mm -hmm. myself in that lion's den? Um, and, and, and that's, that's a really tough one. And, and I, and I see this also too, with, you know, some companies who, you know, <laughs> International Women's Day, which is the one that, that, that kills me where all of a sudden in February, my inbox is filled and they all want me to talk about data because I represent that one woman, even though there's a lot of us like yourself, they come to me and they, you know, you know, can you do a post or can we use your image? I'm like, if you didn't talk to me the 364 other days of the year, I am not going to do this now. And, and that's not something that I'm finding is, 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 is frustrating. That was Jane Davids and Nikki Hobson talking about video. The idea that a woman doesn't know how to do something because they're a woman seems just completely alien to me. We also heard Dr. Hannah Gore and Laurie Niles Hoffman talking about misogyny. And it seems appropriate around now when we're talking around International Women's Day and I wonder how many emails that Laurie's had in her inbox over the last few weeks asking her to speak. International Women's Day this year is subtitled Choose to Challenge and I've blogged about it today as well and suggest you have a look at the blog because I think we should be challenging, we should be asking the questions of speakers and of panels and of organisations. You're going to see lots of tweets and messages and LinkedIn posts over this week where organisations are talking about what they do to support women and how can things change. The first thing I would do is, if you're in the UK, is go onto the gov.uk website and look up those organisations' gender pay gaps. Talking about panels, let's go to the conference one next. This was joyous to record. The combination of guests, the combination of audience, live feedback, just made it an incredible experience to be involved with. And I've mentioned before, the energy was wonderful. The energy can be summed up, I think, in this next clip, where we hear Dana just reacting to something. I would attend sessions because we hit COVID last year. And as I was in the session, I'd be speaking and putting out my thoughts and my comments and my experiences. And people were actually listening. And he reached out to me and he says, you know, 
you have something to say. I think you should be speaking at some of our e-conferences. And that's what led me to speaking to a couple of conferences last year. And then of course I started to, I took on a project and that used up so much more of my time. And again, today I'm really happy because Andrew reached out to me and said, hey, why don't you join us at this women conversation? That's so it. thank you so much, Rita. I think this is such a really interesting topic because Kate, when you first said, oh, Don doesn't get so many solicitations from women speakers, I'm going to be honest with everyone who's listening. I thought, you can do that? You can write to people or reach out to people and ask to be a speaker? I mean, that had never occurred to me legitimately it never occurred to me that that that's how you do it right that you could reach out to people and ask to be a speaker and I don't know if anyone else who's out there listening mm -hmm. had that moment of realization um uh, that certainly stood out for me that you know that's a possible route and that I could have potentially been doing it all of this time she heard Rita Sukrit there and Dana James Edwards responding to a comment from Kate Graham. I love the squeal of delight from Dana when she realises that she can submit to conference organisers her pitches to speak at events. Next up, we've got one of the most thoughtful podcasts. This was recorded in December last year and was the first one that came out after the imposter syndrome. This is the mentoring one, and this is Andrea Watts and Tarina Goel, I think, just nailing in terms of pace and content and context how women talking about learning can be a really powerful tool. When I think about myself in the context of being a mentor, and I think about the fact that I have been and am being mentored, it is really about relationship. Mm. Um, first, firstly, um, connections are really, really important to me. Really important. I know it's my core value, and so relationships as a form, as just mentoring, is a form of relationship, mm. and it's that opportunity, isn't it? I think to to share, to give of yourself, it, and it's not completely altruistic because, as you said, you absolutely get back. You know, you absolutely get something back. And when the women who I have mentored informally have said how it's helped them or they've messaged me afterwards and, and thanked me. I mean, because I, I mentor some people in in respect of the collaging. So people have done the training and then want to use it. I've done some mentoring with those women. So it's very specific to the art. And, for, and that I absolutely love because I know then that they feel more confident to be able to go out and use the tool, use the method yes. with other people. So for me, that kind of mentoring is just, oh, it's, I don't even know if I've got the word, I need an image, but it, it means a lot to me. It fills me, it energizes me, just to be able to help people feel more confident. Absolutely. To because it, it's isn't it like it's a real opportunity to make a difference. Yeah. You know, when, when you empower somebody, and uh, they benefit from um, achieving positive outcomes. You feel you've, you've done something, you've made a difference. And in, in my work with immigrants and refugees, I see their social and economic progress in front of my eyes. Like it all unravels. Their story mm -hmm. is, is developing in front of me. And of course, you get to meet a lot of interesting people. And, mm -hmm. and uh, as you recognize the challenges that are faced by others, I find that I become more grateful for what I have already. The episodes where the guests don't know each other beforehand spring some wonderful surprises. Sometimes the guests speak with each other beforehand, sometimes they don't. I love this episode, and I could have put the whole thing in my greatest hits. This is the inclusive learning culture one, where Coral and Gail just absolutely went for it. And I keep going back and listening to this one again because there's so many elements of it that I know I need to take into account to improve my practice. You know, these are the things you should be aware of. Remember, you know, diversity uh, enriches us as a company, but then they don't 
talk about how to then make that inclusive and how to to bring people and i think that there's definitely different ways we can do that um i mean certainly something that i've been looking at recently is more sort of immersive learning so getting people to really experience what it's like to be on the to be on that side and to be inside someone else's shoes if you will um, and i think feeling that at a sort of really visceral level um, can be really transformational for people. But unless you feel that, because as I just said earlier that, you know, I, I didn't, it didn't really occur to me before that there weren't a lot of um, non-English speakers in L&D. And that speaks to my own sort of privilege and own knowledge and background that I didn't, I haven't experienced that. And I think that that's one thing we can really do is push that sort of experiential learning and um and and put that forward i agree and also i think it becomes easier because when you start having people who are maybe non-english or what different in a positive <laughs> way um it's easier for them to have a conversation with the next generation or the next in line so for example i would have lost my boss to tell me listen girl um when i was still in the corporate I don't see you being on track for management for simply because the way you communicate, mm. uh, I'm very extrovert, I'm very Mediterranean, and I can be perceived as emotional and maybe a bit unstructured. And it wouldn't fit with the um, organizations um, as a manager in an organization I was working at the time, uh, which were well male dominated, um, mm. very traditional. And, uh, and I would have liked my boss to maybe said, well, maybe you should need to work on your voice and the way you express yourself, maybe. But it was probably quite hard for him was even though from a multicultural background, born and, um, and educated in this country, to differentiate what was the, um, the um, outside of my communication, the external part, the, the one that, um, that doesn't affect me personally. Like, so I said, I mean, maybe your voice is a bit uh, too high or uh, maybe you move a little bit too much in a meeting just you know try to control those little thing um, when uh, it's it can be perceived when you're in an insider uh, maybe as a, a very difficult conversation to have mm. but for me when I talk to one of my colleagues um, and I try to say well you know as a producer for example uh, when there is a disaster you really have to control your voice so you, I know you're maybe um, you're maybe from a, a different you know a voice is quite high a little bit like mine similar kind of background so you know, we really need to make sure that we're very calm and and we've been working on it but it's absolutely not personal because we we kind of both uh, foreign and that's uh, that's just mm. a matter of controlling the language it's external it's not personal and uh, and and that thing that's probably makes um, makes a little bit of a difference i would hope to have some idea about what's going to happen in the episodes when i schedule in the speakers and the topics this next one i didn't have a clue i had no idea where this was going to go this is Leo Locher and Jackie Clark on the lockdown one. We, we've sort of discovered we're human. This is sound going to sound terrible. <laughs> like, um, you know, all of a sudden, everybody very obviously has a life, you know, yeah. have like a place they live in or not. People have families or not. People have responsibilities or not. People have health issues or not. Mm. And all the facade, the picture we've been projecting, the, you know, we put on our work personality, rock up in an office, do the office thing, and then leave again. Um, all of that has gone away for, for better or for worse. And, and we're discovering we're human. And I think on the one hand, I find it really touching and amazing mm. on the other hand i think it also makes inequalities a lot more obvious it's almost like you know in school you like in school when you have school uniform you know everybody sort of technically looks roughly the same except that that never worked in the first place but you know the, the fiction is that everybody looks the same and um and that's all a bit gone now and i think that's mm. That's a really interesting conundrum to to work through. So. Oh, absolutely! I think it, it it's such a good point that 
the divide is almost bigger now than it ever was where actually for some people they're finding it better because they're not having to pretend they're not having to show up and pretend like everything's okay when it's not but I think for people who are in circumstances where it's not okay that sort of escape of going somewhere else and pretending like it is okay was actually an escape rather than a facade it was you know it was a positive thing and I think that that is such a valuable point that actually you know lockdown has brought so many things for so many people and you know it's been different for every single person of course it has but I think there is definitely that that inequality that is being seen more and more now depending on the the circumstances that people live in depending on the the family situations as you mentioned earlier like there's such a shift but I think also even just um working environments everyone's been put back into their home as a working environment and I know for for some people that's really nice because they've got a home office and they're really set up and it's really comfy and staying home is great but for other people you know they're perched from an ironing board on the end of their sofa in you know a, a tiny space trying to look after kids and and do everything at once so I think all of that sort of social classing as well has has proven quite a big difference as to how people have dealt with lockdown and whether it's been quite a pleasant um, scenario or whether it's been quite challenging for people. One of the privileges that I get from being in the room when these are recorded is to hear firsthand the first class thinking and analysis that the speakers have considered or are considering at that point as part of the conversation. I've always said the best episodes are the ones that feel like you're just eavesdropping in a conversation. But sometimes the level that the conversation, the depth that the conversation goes to, just astonishes me. This was one of those. This is the lifelong learning one, where Sharon Green and Miriam Leland really start pulling lifelong learning apart and trying to understand what it is and what it means things that education does for people is for most people i should say Mm. of course not for everybody because there's people who have like you know who are slightly different or or learn differently but for most people it does give like the confidence um Mm. as well and i was reading some research that the people who who are like successful academically, they are the ones that are participating in lifelong learning, you know, Mm. naturally. So I think that relation is really important to to acknowledge. Mm. And I think that's where the curiosity comes from as well, because you need to be confident almost, you know, to be curious, Mm. if that makes sense. Mm. Mm. And I can think, or maybe to kind of, I think some of the things that, um, that came when we, so obviously we kind of were reaching out or being curious with our networks about what do they think about lifelong learning since we thought it was such this massive topic that how yeah. on earth were we going to speak about it and I think what some of the things that came came through there that I found really interesting was um was you know this the, this curiosity and it got me thinking do we how do we acquire that how do we kind of um feed that who encourages that is that something to do with our innate in our education um, or um and our experience or is it something that we um that we learn as we as we grow or as we go from people which i found kind of interesting and i, I certainly don't have the answers but i was i just curiosity seemed to come up quite a lot Yes, um, I do think, though, that that does come from people who are highly educated, you know, mm. who speak about lifelong learning that way, because mm. when you look at the whole concept and, and it is really broad. Right. And you need to distinguish between like the, I was actually seeing some figures I, I didn't know was that old, but there was like a report from OECD from 1970 something and one from uh, I think it was UNICEF. Mm. also uh let me, no sorry it was unesco mm. from 1972 and that distinction unesco focusing on you know social equality and um you know civic um what's the word like engagement yeah. 
and then OECD more focusing on lifelong learning from an economic perspective. Mm. So I think that distinction and people are still debating because depending on what where your focus is, you know, that is how you shape how you think about lifelong learning mm. and it's com to two completely different. Well, not always for higher educated people, it, it's probably quite integrated. Mm. But for people who are disadvantaged, it isn't at all. So mm. it's easy to say that it's great to be curious and stuff. But if you need to, you know, fight for your job and your income, then, mm. you, you know, you really don't care that much yeah. about that stuff. That episode with Sharon and Miriam was so well researched by the pair of them that I have to give it more time and listen to it again. The guests put a lot of work into the episodes. Sometimes two, three conversations between them beforehand. And you can hear it in the quality of the advice and the guidance and the support that they give each other and they also give the audience. Here's a couple of examples. What are some of the things that you've done to develop your own practice? So I read quite a lot. I mean, there is fantastic things on LinkedIn these days. Um, and, and I read all of that. There, there's a certain lady who, who keeps posting, I think it's light bulb something. Um, who gives some amazing and wonderful useful tips and shares some great stuff I will look so her up read hers, go and look her up um, and I'm, 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 we all know that basically it just usually comes down to play yeah um, if I mean for example if you're part of a training department put some time aside with the software that you've got create one and just pl everybody play with yes. it try things out maybe somebody's got some ideas about oh we could do this fine give it a go it's not so easy for people like myself where you're using what you've been told I mean honestly if I don't know Skype for Business today something's very wrong but <laughs> I'm playing with um, MS Teams you mm -hmm. can get a free Teams account it's not going to do everything that your in-house one does but it gives you a good a good start zoom yeah you've got a free account it doesn't give you everything that again a paid for will do but it gives you a good starting point um i actually did attend a course there, there's lovely webinars free sessions um that different people and, and companies and places again offer that maybe it's not ones that you are actually taking but you can be a part of and maybe you get shown something that you didn't know before yeah and that's that's where all this comes in and i'm gonna end on the more of a light light-hearted um, <laughs> just just to be different really and it was something that i heard at kindfest but i think it, it really just sums up everything we've been talking about and it's this question what is the roi of your mum <laughs> <laughs> And I just that just for me is that it's 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 the heart of why we're here. Yeah. That's why we're talking about passion. We've forgotten what it means to love. Mm. Why are we going to work? Why? If we can't bring our whole selves and our heart, there's no point. For me yeah. anyway. Yeah. Thank you, Probably Jane. Probably wasn't that lighthearted actually in the end, but yeah. That was Joe Cook and Michelle Kay on the online learning one it seemed relevant at the time and is still relevant now because guess what there's lots of online delivery still happening you also heard jane harrison and lorna leeson with the passion one again that's an episode i could quite easily have just lifted and shifted and put into this whole thing there are elements of that that I have, and I will go back to listen again. Our last clip is something a bit special. It's next week's episode, and it's one clip that I think describes next week's episode quite neatly. You know, a lot of negative, for me personally, a lot of negativity comes from not having control over things. Like I'm self, 
confirmed whatever you say control freak I just love control I like to know when things are happening and what's going on so you can imagine how I've dealt with the last year so well uh no I haven't um but every day I'll just ask myself what can I control about the situation how you know what are the things I can do that that are going to make me feel better I can control what I put in my body how I move my body where I spend my free time what kind of things I listen to. Like I had a friend say yesterday, one of her strategies is she goes on a news detox. And, and that is, honestly, that has been a complete game changer for me. Just not going to watch the news for a week. And I'm going to just be really careful about what I engage with on social media because I need to really control that space around me and kind of protect my energy. And, and yeah, that's it. You've got to kind of protect your energy and kind of also with work and, and your personal life and stuff, go where the energy is. If you feel like you're in a situation where you're butting heads against a wall, go where there is energy because there will be energy everywhere, even small pockets you can just focus on and they're gonna, they're gonna get you through and, and help you feel better about a situation for sure. That's Amy Young, one of our guests on the negativity one, which is up next week. Thank you for listening to this special episode. It's been incredibly hard work for me to cut and find all of the bits that I've liked. And to be honest, I could have done two or three of these episodes. If there are clips and bits that you've liked that you haven't heard, then please let us know. If there are bits that you have liked, then tell us why. Like I said... The negativity one is the next one coming up. And we've got a few more that we're recording in the next couple of days. If you want to be a guest, please let us know. Contact us through the website, womentalkingaboutlearning.com. As always, thank you once again for listening. And we'll see you again soon. You have been listening to the Women Talking About Learning podcast. Women Talking About Learning is available on all podcast platforms, including Apple and Google Podcasts. You'll also find us on Spotify, Amazon Music, and other music streaming services. Make sure to like and subscribe. It helps more people find us. You can find out more about Women Talking About Learning via our website, womentalkingaboutlearning.com. Make sure you tune in next time for more Women Talking About Learning more of the signal and none of the noise.